Well, if you remember from last week, some of the elders were up here to share with you the vision and mission statements that, and core values that we as elders have been processing over the last uh, several weeks, um, actually several months, based on the feedback that we'd received from you as a congregation during the listening sessions that we did earlier this spring and through the summer. So if you weren't here last week and you uh, weren't able to hear some of that, I encourage you to go to, uh, to our YouTube channel that we have for EBC and uh, be sure to listen to that to, um, to hear about uh, the vision and direction um, that we believe God is calling us to go as a church. Also during this month, we're going to be looking at our vision statement and our mission statement and talking about them and reflecting on the, the, what we believe the call God has for, uh, for EBC going into the future. When Pastor Stan returns in December, he'll be going over, uh, over the core values uh, that we've laid out um, that we believe God is calling us to, uh, to embrace together as a church. So just as a reminder, um, the vision for EBC that we believe God is, is calling us to, uh, to embrace is this, that Christ would be seen by all. That Christ would be seen by all. And last week's message focused in particular on the biblical foundations uh, that we believe undergird that, that sense of vision that we feel God is calling us to. That we want to be a church that magnifies the Lord Jesus, that lifts up the Lord Jesus, that displays the Lord Jesus in all that we do, uh, all that we do and say. Now, flowing out of that vision is our mission, and mission is what guides our steps as we seek to um, pursue the vision. And so, the the mission then for EBC is to bring pleasure and glory to Christ Jesus by expressing His life obeying his will, and advancing his kingdom. So we want all to see Christ. And we believe the way that we enable that to happen is that we as a church will bring, glory, bring pleasure and glory to Christ Jesus in these three distinct ways, expressing his life, obeying his will, and advancing his kingdom. So today, I want to focus on expressing his life, that aspect of our mission, Next week, we'll talk about what it means to obey his will. And then uh, the last week of November, we'll talk about advancing his kingdom. And then upon Pastor Stan's return, we'll look at our core, core values. So I want to break the mission statement down into these three uh, components. Now, this is a little bit different than what we normally do here on Sunday mornings. As many of you know, uh, we teach through the Bible, through books of the Bible, uh, and that's been a hallmark of this church for, uh, for the last 25 years. And just so you know, we're, we're not backing away from that at all. Um, in fact, we have a, a sermon series on the book of Acts that's coming up in January that Pastor Stan and I will be uh, co-teaching together over the course of the next year. So lots more Bible uh, to come your way. And we'll continue with our expositional preaching. But we want to pay particular attention to the call we believe God has on this church. And so we will be looking at the biblical foundations of the vision and mission statement um, that we believe God is giving us so that we, again, together as a church, can move into our future with courage, with confidence, and knowing that God is guiding and leading our, our steps. So with all this said as way, by way of introduction, let's pray and ask for God's blessing upon our time in his word as we learn what it means to express the life of Jesus. Please pray with me. Father, we ask now that as we open up your word that you would be our teacher and our instructor by the power of your spirit, that Christ would continue to be formed in our lives and our hearts, that we would express his life and you would express his life in us and through us and by the power of your spirit. Lord, we want all to see Christ, Christ in us, the hope of glory. But Lord, teach us what it means to live in union with you, to live out the life that your Son has birthed within us by the power of the Holy Spirit as we anticipate the day when we get to actually see you face to face in the new kingdom, in the new Jerusalem, the new heavens, and the new earth. Lord, we long for that day when we don't have to live by faith, we can see you by sight. But until that great day comes, Lord, strengthen our faith, encourage our faith, that we may 
walk with you in obedience and in your, the power that you enable us with. So be with us this morning as we learn from your word. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. I became a Christian in the summer of 1992 at a summer camp on the coast of Washington, just actually a few hours from, uh, from where we are here. And that first summer um, that I was at camp, um, I heard the gospel very clearly uh, for the first time in my life. I was 16 years old, and uh, for me, it was a Damascus Road type experience. It was a radical co- uh, conversion, darkness to light, uh, from, from what I was living, the life I was living within, to the life that God was bringing me out of, and, and um, it, was, um, it, w- it was miraculous. It, it was new birth. Uh, born again, uh, Holy Spirit opened my eyes, um, a, a very radical uh, conversion experience. So I thought summer camp was where you meet Jesus, uh, because I found church to be very um, uninspiring at that time in my life. Um, things have changed since then. Uh, my ecclesiology has grown and developed a bit, uh, but I found church to be very uh, very, very boring, very mundane, and summer camp was where, it seemed like summer camp was where all the, uh, all the action uh, was. Now part of the problem was the, the church that I was actually going to at that time, but that's another story um, in and of itself. So I wanted to go back to camp to, to see Jesus again the way that I saw him that summer when I was 16. So that next summer, I went back again to the same camp, and at the end of uh, the week together, they had these commitment cards that they encouraged everyone to sign who felt like they're ready to take their next step in their uh, discipleship and their faith in Jesus. So being just very zealous and and wanting to grow and genuinely wanting to know the Lord Jesus, I signed that card uh, without a moment's hesitation. And the counselors had warned us ahead of time and said, you know, think about this, pray about it. Don't just sign the commitment just because you, you want to, but really... Is the Lord calling you to do this and to take it very seriously? So, again, I signed it with no hesitation, and one of the counselors kind of warned me, you know, I said, you know, don't do this too hastily, but I was, I was all in because I, I wanted to please Jesus. So the commitment card said this, that over the course of the next 365 days, the next year, in every decision that you make, in every decision you make, you will do this. You will ask WWJD. Now, some of you probably heard that formula before. Um, Some of you may be new to you, but what WWJD stands for is what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? And the commitment card said that in every decision you make, you would ask the question, what would Jesus do? And then the implication is you would do what Jesus would do. Um, and so I thought, well, I want to do what Jesus would do. I love Jesus. I want to follow him. So I signed up. And uh, for the first uh, couple of weeks after I got home, it went okay. I was WWJD pretty well. Um, but then a few months in, I would either forget or I would um, not do what Jesus would do. I wouldn't know what Jesus would do. And it became very, very confusing and discouraging, and within a few months, I simply threw the card away and felt like a complete and total failure. It was actually kind of a crisis moment for me there in my my young Christian walk and just feeling like I'm not really a disciple because I I failed to keep my commitment to Jesus. I didn't do the WWJD thing well. Well, over time, I learned that the, the tradition of WWJD actually came out of a classic Christian book written in the uh, late 1800s by a pastor named Charles Sheldon. It's called In His Steps. Some of you may have, uh, may have read the book or are familiar with it, but it's, a, um, it's actually not a bad book itself. It's a novel about a pastor who's discouraged by his congregation and their lack of compassion for others, and so he challenges his congregation to... Uh, to ask WWJD and all that they do and say, and then uh, the congregation does it, and the story goes on, and all these amazing things start happening when, when Christians would finally just ask, what would Jesus do, and then simply do it. Now, there are some issues with WWJD. There are some issues with uh, Charles Sheldon's book and this whole approach to the Christian life. And so I would put it like this. The WWJD formula 
is predicated on some assumptions. And here are the assumptions. That, that, that Jesus' life and teachings are timeless, universal principles available to all of humanity. That they're just out there. And this is what Charles Sheldon actually believed. That, 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 that Jesus' life and teachings, his ethics were, were timeless principles applicable to all humanity. And if you just had the right amount of moral effort... Um, social and moral revolution would occur throughout the world. So if more people would just learn the teachings of Jesus and put in the right amount of effort to make them happen, the world would change. And that was Charles Sheldon's vision. And I think the counselors at the camp that I went to were well-intentioned and wanted to challenge us in our discipleship. And I think they assumed that if we would apply ourselves diligently to asking WWJD, that it would happen and our lives would change. Now those of you who are um, discerning and know your scriptures well could probably see some of the problems there are in these assumptions, like sin, um, like that Jesus' teachings, as helpful as they are, unless you have the power of the Spirit empowering them, they're, not, uh, they're useless to us, right? Like if the Holy Spirit isn't active and if we don't take seriously the fact that we have indwelling sin and that we are, we, are, we are fallen creatures, that trying to do WWJD will get very, very discouraging after a while. It's not up to our own moral effort in, in growing as a Christian. However, even in our evangelical world, even in our evangelical world, in the way that we uh, approach faith as evangelicals, there are some gaps sometimes in our understanding of how to live out the Christian life as well. So, moving on from WWJD, I embraced another model that I thought would be more biblical that I was being encouraged and taught, and I called it, and this was the, the thankfulness model. Now, the person that was teaching me this didn't actually call it the thankfulness model, but it was just simply what, uh, what it really became. So after I moved on from WWJD and saw some of the faults with that as a young Christian, I embraced um, a formula that maybe some of you are familiar with, maybe some of you have experienced or, or, or tried, or maybe are, are thinking that this is the, the Bible's way to really grow as a Christian. But in, in this formula, in this formula, we have the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, that that's what saves us, that we're helpless apart from anything that we can do. We need Jesus to save us. And that once Jesus, because of his life, death, and resurrection, he saves us, then um, it's free grace. It's not anything we do. We receive it, and then we respond in thankfulness. And, and it's Christ does this for us, and so what we do for him is we respond in faith and thankfulness. So our obedience to Jesus is our thankful response for what he's done for us. Now, there's some good biblical uh, weight to this, right? Because we are supposed to respond to what he's done for us. We are supposed to respond in thankfulness. And, and our life and our obedience is, is, a, is a worshipful thanks to, uh, to the fact that he has saved us. However, there are some, some pitfalls in this formula as well that I discovered as a young Christian. And perhaps some of you discovered too. Is that, again, due to indwelling sin, we don't always feel joyful and thankful in life. And we're not always responding out of joy and thankfulness to the Lord. We should be, but for many of us, always feeling thankful and joyful doesn't, doesn't happen. And this model depends a lot on the feelings of being thankful and joyful when you know you should be, even if you feel that you, you aren't. And again, like the WWJD model, this puts a lot of, a lot of emphasis on us as believers as followers on our response. Again, it's up to us to conjure up the right response. It's up to us to conjure up the right effort to respond appropriately to that which Jesus has done for us. And I found with the, the thankfulness model that even though there's biblical precedent for being thankful, 
I found that I became discouraged very quickly because I wasn't always thankful and joyful the way that I should be. I think that there is another way, another approach to expressing the life of Christ that is not only rooted more biblically, but is also encouraging and empowering and sets us free to truly obey and love and express the life of Christ. John Calvin, one of the founding fathers of our Protestant faith, those of you who are just at the Reformation Conference that we had this weekend here, um, Calvin, John Calvin is one of the the key founders of our Protestant faith who, who start, helped to start the, the Reformation period um, in the 1500s that we celebrate in October and we celebrated uh, just this last weekend with a conference that we had here at the church. Calvin said this. He said, first, we as Christians must understand that as long as Christ remains outside of us and we are separated from him, all that he has suffered and done for the salvation of the human race remains useless and of no value for us. Therefore, to share with us what he has received from the Father, he had to become ours and to dwell within us. For, as I have said, all that he possesses is nothing to us until we grow into one body with him. It is true that we obtain this by faith. In other words, Calvin said that, that Jesus' life and death and resurrection, as earth-changing as it is, as dramatic as it is, unless it's somehow personally applied in our lives, it remains useless to us. That you can be thankful for what Jesus has done and have it not change your life. You can ask the question, what would Jesus do and learn from his ethics and his teachings and have his death and resurrection do nothing for you? Calvin said, unless it somehow indwells us and transforms us from the inside out, his death and resurrection holds no meaning to us. So Calvin said, we must become one. One and united to this Jesus who died and rose again for us. We must somehow share in his death and his resurrection. We must somehow, we must somehow um, receive the benefits of his death and resurrection. And Calvin said this is done by faith. So I want to suggest another paradigm to you. Another paradigm in how we express the life of Christ and the foundation for growing as a Christian. And this paradigm can simply be called, not I, but through Christ in me. Not I, but through Christ in me. That the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, plus a saving union with him through the Spirit, equals ongoing sanctification, that's just another word for growing into holiness, and conformity into Christ's image. That you have what Jesus did for us 2,000 years ago in his death and his resurrection, and then that gets applied to us by the power of the Holy Spirit, where, we're, where Christ becomes one with us in a mysterious way. Christ indwells us. Christ takes over, and, and, and the Holy Spirit um, comes into us, and in that way we find transformation. And the goal of life then isn't just simply to imitate the teachings of Jesus or to be thankful for him, but the goal is to actually become like him, to grow into his image. That God's purpose for us isn't that we would simply just get, become a better version of ourselves. We become more and more like Christ. So by the time we meet him one day in glory, we are like him. We are recreated and made into his image. But this doesn't happen by our own moral effort. It happens by the power of Christ through the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, reshaping us and remolding us because of our union with him. So what I want to do now is talk about what it means to express the life of Christ and to do so from the vantage point of our union with him. 
our union with him. So I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. And this will be the main text that will be in here this morning. And we're going to hear from the Apostle Paul and his own testimony about what union with Christ means for him and then apply that to, to us. Galatians chapter 2. Now, if you're new to the Bible, you're not quite sure where to find Galatians, you want to turn to the New Testament, so about two-thirds of the way through your Bible, and find the book of Matthew. After Matthew goes Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the, the four Gospels, the stories of Jesus' life and teachings. From there, we have Acts, Romans, and then 1, 2 Corinthians, and Galatians is right next to Corinthians. So if you see 2 Corinthians, Galatians is right next to it. We're going to be in chapter 2. Now, just some quick background on, um, on Galatians. This is probably one of Paul's earliest letters. In my opinion, it's actually his first letter. And it's written to the churches that he planted in Acts chapters 13 and 14. So if you see in the book of Acts, Paul and Barnabas are sent out from Antioch. And they go through an area called southern Galatia, that region. And they begin a series of, of churches and at the end of chapter 14, uh, through many trials and tribulations, they return back to, uh, to Antioch where they are commended for, for their work. However, in the wake of Paul's and Barnabas' work and their, their mission, um, Jewish converts, they're probably ex-Pharisees that were called Judaizers, Judaizers, they came into these churches that Paul had started and said, hey, that's great you've got Jesus. You believe in his death and his resurrection, and, you, and by faith you're saved. That's wonderful. But if you want to go all the way to be a real disciple, to be a real child of God's family, if you want to go, if you really want the full blessings, you have to be circumcised. And you have to follow the laws of Moses. And they opened up their Old Testament, and they looked at Genesis 17 and a number of other texts, and these young Christian converts said, well, okay. We, we want to be fully devoted to Jesus, so we will get circumcised, and we will submit ourselves to the law of Moses, and we will, um, we will continue to follow Jesus by following Moses. And so Paul writes this, this fiery letter in response and says a dramatic, no, this is not how you follow Jesus. The law of Moses is useless to you. If you define yourself by circumcision, you're actually cutting yourself off from Christ. So beginning here in chapter 2, let's see what Paul writes about here in response to, um, to these, uh, this false teaching they're getting from the Judaizers. Verse 16 of chapter 2, Paul says, Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ, not by works of law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Now, elsewhere in Paul's writings, he says that the law is good and holy and from God. But the law is useless for the human heart. The human heart is so corrupt, all the law can do is just point out its own corruption. The law cannot save you. So Paul says no one can be made right with God by following the Mosaic law. No one can be made right with God simply by being circumcised and trying to follow the, the, the diet of Moses and the, um, all the sacrificial laws. No one can be put right because it doesn't deal with the depths of sin in the human heart. Verse 17, so Paul says, but if in our endeavors to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. He says, if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. In other words, Paul says, if I go back to the law, all it's going to show is that I am a sinner. The law does nothing to help me grow closer to Christ or to be saved. Then Paul says in verse 19, for through the law, I die to the law so that I might live to God. So the law not only points out Paul's sin, but the law actually slays him 
and condemns him. And Paul says, this is a good thing. It's a good thing that the law condemns me. It's a good thing that my sin is exposed because if the law slays me, right, the law condemns me, then it prepares me to live to God. How is that possible? How can the law point out our sin and condemn us and kill us, so to speak, spiritually kill us? How is that good news? How does that actually help us grow closer to God? Well, look at what Paul says in verse 20. Verse 20. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify or set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Friends, Galatians 2.20 is one of the most important texts, in my opinion, in the New Testament for us as Christians to understand, live by, memorize, and hold to. It is our identity. It is what is true about us. and is what's true about our future. And it's the hope and anchor for our souls. And if we would understand... Paul's statement here and understand its implications for our lives, it would set us free from the burden of things like WWJD or things like always feeling like you have to be thankful or joyful even when when you are not or feeling like it is all up to us to, to be sanctified. It's up to us to have to learn how to please God. It's up to us to have to respond properly. Galatians 2.20 sets us free from the self-directed life and gives us a whole new orientation towards God and a whole new reality to live by. It is exactly what Calvin was talking about. That somehow, some way, the death and resurrection of Jesus 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem has to somehow get to us here and now. And this is how it gets here. Christ in me. The benefits of his death and resurrection become mine as Christ indwells me. So let's, um, let's take a look at Paul's language here. There's three realities Paul talks about in relation to our union with Christ. Three realities that he talks about here in Galatians 2.20 that I want to unpack. Number one, he says that we have been crucified with Christ. Crucified with Christ. Now, in other parts of Paul's letters, he talks about uh, the old man, the old self, dying away. That when you become a Christian, something happens to you. The old life is crucified. Something dies. Now, when Jesus died on the cross... Jesus took all of our sin upon himself. Jesus took all the sins of the world upon himself. There, he, he bore the wrath of God and the consequence of all that sin. So Jesus' death then, Jesus' death takes the sins of the world away, buries them, literally, buries them. And when we become a Christian, that same experience happens with us. That something is crucified, something dies, something is, something goes away. Now, it's strange to think about this because um, we still feel the, the remaining presence of sin in our lives. Even if we've walked with Jesus for, for you know, most of our lives, and many of you walked faithfully with Jesus for throughout your life, many of you walked with Jesus for several decades, um, some of you might be new to the faith, but you're seeking to walk with Jesus, and you still feel sin. You still feel the, 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 the remaining effects of, of sin. I still feel the remaining effects of my sin, and I've been a believer for over 20 years. But yet, there's a truth here that the old me has still been crucified. Something has died away. And ultimately, when Paul says that I have been crucified with Christ, he's talking about my old self-directed life has died. 
the old goals, the old ambitions, the old lifestyle, it has died and it is gone. It has been forgiven and it has been redeemed. A famous uh, political writer named Malcolm Muggeridge, um, some of you may have, may have um, heard of him, he's a, from a previous generation, um, had, a, uh, had a radical conversion and became a Christian. And one of Muggeridge's famous statements was that when he became a Christian, he said he was set free from the deep, dark dungeon of his own ego. The deep, dark dungeon of his own ego. In other words, he was set free, liberated from himself and living for himself and being obsessed with himself. And that's what being crucified with Christ means. Friends, that the burden of yourself you've been set free from. The burden of living selfishly, pursuing your own agenda, your own desires, just, just the obsession that we live with ourselves, we've been set free from and given a new direction and a new orientation for our lives. We've been crucified with Christ. Second thing then, something has died, but something now has also come to life. We've been crucified with Christ, but we've also been raised with Christ. We've been raised with Christ. So something dies, but something comes to life. Something comes to life. We've been set free from the burden of ourselves, and we've been given something new. So Theologically, we call this the doctrine of regeneration. Some of you have heard of this word, regeneration. Regeneration is, is the idea that the Spirit of God causes, causes us to be born again or born from above. In John chapter 3, when Jesus was speaking with the Pharisee Nicodemus, if you remember the story, um, there's a Pharisee named Nicodemus who's very intrigued by Jesus and, and wants to learn more about him, but doesn't want to meet with him during the day because he doesn't want his friends to know that he's actually talking to Jesus. So he meets with Jesus at night, and he begins to, to converse with him, and Jesus says, unless you are born from above, unless you are born from above, you know, you will never see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus scratches his head and says, what do I climb back into my mom's womb and, and get born again? Like, like, what are you talking about, Jesus? This makes no sense. And then Jesus talks about the Spirit, being born from the Spirit. And this is what Paul means when he talks about us being raised with Christ. That somehow through the Holy Spirit, we are born to a new life with God. New desires, new hopes. New, uh, new aspirations, a new, a new desire to love and please the Lord. When I became a Christian at that, that, at that beach when I was 16 years old on the coast of, of, of Washington, something changed inside of me to where I had these newfound desires to love Jesus, to please Jesus. And I can't tell you where they came. Well, I know where they came from. They came from the Holy Spirit. Like they, they, it, it was a strange thing to me. Like all of a sudden I had this desire to read my Bible. I'd never read the Bible before. Every time I tried to read the Bible, I couldn't understand it. All of a sudden I was desiring to read the Bible. I was, I was hungering to know Jesus. And again, I, I was not part of a strong church. I wasn't discipled well. And, and it was a lot of twists and turns and having to figure things out on my own. It was a long strenuous journey there, but, um, but all, th all through that journey, it was this desire, like, I want to know Jesus. I want to please Jesus. That's what led me to, to sign the blasted WWJD card a year later and, you know, miserably fail, <laughs> fall into that failure, but it was born out of a sincere desire to know Jesus, and that's what the Holy Spirit does. The old life has been crucified, but a new life has been born with new desires, to follow Jesus, and so we are to nurture these new desires and, and nurture them so that we can express the life of Christ. You've been raised with Christ. It is a gift from God that something new has come into the place of that which is old. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul in the letter uh, to Colossians. In Colossians 3, Paul says this, If then you've been raised with Christ... Now seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. 
Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This is who we are. This is where we are. And this is what is coming for us in Christ. We are in Christ. Christ is in us. We belong to him. And that leads to the third point. We've been crucified with Christ. We've been raised with Christ. So now, in this present time, until we see him again, as Paul just talked about in Colossians, we live in Christ, and Christ lives in us. Paul says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I live now, in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And what Christ is doing inside of us, so when Paul says it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me, it doesn't mean that, that Paul goes away or, or he's no more. It means that his, his life, his personality, his whole entire life is now molded into Christ's. It's molded into Christ, and that's what he's doing with us. He's taking you and he's molding you into Christ. Now, here's the irony. Here's the irony. The more you're molded into Christ, the more you become the real you God intended you to be. The more you're molded into Christ, the more you become you. Now, C.S. Lewis, um, one of my my favorite um, writers, talked about this. He said um, he, was, he was talking about Jesus' call in, in Matthew, uh, Matthew 16, where Jesus says, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it, but whoever gains his life will lose it. And C.S. Lewis said that the way to really become yourself and find yourself isn't to look within, but it's to look to Jesus. And he said, the more we we give our lives away to Jesus, the more we actually get our life back and become the person that God intended us to be. Now, friends, our society is obsessed with finding our true selves. If you go to any local bookstore, uh, if you read any, uh, any, you know, cultural commentary on, on, on just the age of anxiety that people are living in, like, everyone is obsessed with finding themselves, self-help discovery, like discovering your true self, discovering your true identity. Like, like that is, it's a cultural uh, obsession. And so again, cultural commentators call uh, the, the world we live in an age of anxiety where everyone is, is anxious about finding themselves and finding who they are. And oftentimes the, the journey towards finding yourself is to look within yourself and to go deep within yourself And that's how you find who you really are. Well, friends, the deeper you go into yourself to find yourself, guess guess what you're going to find? Yourself. Right? It's the, the deep, dark dungeon of the ego. But when you turn from yourself to Christ, and you look to him, and he begins to transform you, then the person God intended you to become begins to manifest because God intends you to become like his son. So you become the unique you that God created you to be as you are conformed to the image of Christ. The path to self-discovery is Christ, not ourselves. So we live in Christ, and Christ lives in us And we have a new hope and a new destiny to be made in his image. Again, that all may see Christ, that Christ may be seen in us. That's our calling. That's the destiny that that we are to embrace. So for Paul then, for Paul, expressing the life of Christ is not so much about trying to imitate Jesus as worthy as that is, or being thankful to Jesus, as worthy as that is, but it's about participating 
in his death and resurrection through a saving union with him. You express the life of Christ. You express the life of Christ not by trying to imitate him, though we do want to imitate him. Again, not by, by, by trying to conjure up feelings of thankfulness for what he's done, though we are supposed to be thankful. But ultimately, the life of Christ is expressed through us as we participate in his ongoing, in his, in his death and resurrection through an ongoing union with him through the power of the Spirit. All of your life, you're going to be continuing to see the old self be crucified and new life being birthed within you. God takes us through this process that we call sanctification, becoming more like Jesus, and it is a death and resurrection process all throughout our life. You're always going to be putting away the old self until we see Jesus again. But the new self that's been risen with Christ as we continue on our journey towards Jesus should be coming more and more manifest. That the glory and beauty of Jesus' image within us should become more and more evident the older we get and the further we get on the journey. So in summary then, in summary, not I but through Christ in me means this. That believers express Christ's life and character by becoming more conscious of their saving union with him. That believers express Christ's life and character through becoming more conscious of their saving union with him. Now next week we'll talk about obedience and the relationship between our union with Christ and obedience and faith and works. We'll, we'll look at, we'll look at the, the connection between the two. But what I want to just camp out on here is the reality that you are united to him. You are one with him. And that this is where it all begins. What you do as a follower of Jesus flows out of who you are. And who you are is in Christ, with Christ, through Christ, for Christ. Christ is all in all. The reason I chose the word to become more conscious of our saving union is that I don't believe we're conscious enough of it. We don't talk often enough about it. Let me give you an example. We often refer to our salvation in the terms taught to us by uh, reformers like Martin Luther and John Calvin in terms of justification. In fact, um, both Calvin and Luther believe that justification is the doctrine that the church stands or fall on. The doctrine of justification, for those of you that may not be familiar with, with uh, that wording, is that, that we are saved by Christ alone, through faith alone, through grace alone, through no works of our own. It is all through Christ. You are made right with Christ by your free justification given to you in Jesus. Absolutely true. We never want to back off that one single inch. However, however, your justification is for a purpose beyond just your justification. The purpose of your justification is to get you to Christ, to get you to God. To get you the, to, it opens the door to your relationship with God. It's not the be all end all, it's the beginning point. For Paul, Paul's justification language, where he talks about the righteousness of God and being justified, in his letters occurs probably less than 10 times. Less than 10 times. Doesn't mean it's not important, it is important, it's critical but it appears probably less than 10 times. However, Paul's language of being in Christ, Paul's language of being in Christ, in Jesus, in the Lord, guess how many times that occurs throughout his letters in the New Testament? 143. 143. And that's not counting other prepositions like with Christ or through Christ. Now, this isn't because Paul doesn't think justification is important. It's foundational, as I've just said. And the Reformers believed it was foundational as well. 
But the reformers and Paul also emphasized that union with Christ is the goal. Conformity to Christ's image is the goal. And the reason Paul and the other New Testament writers, and I just give you Paul's numbers. I didn't even give you the other New Testament writers. There's dozens more texts that John and Peter will, and the writer of Hebrews will use with this in Christ language is because they want to drill this into your mind and into your heart that you are in Christ and Christ is in you. And your identity as a believer is rooted in this reality that it's not up to you to figure it out. It's not up to you to have to respond correctly. It's not up to you to figure out your own sanctification. You are his, and he is yours. In fact, Martin Luther, Martin Luther, the other founding father of our Protestant faith, he said that, that when, you, when we are justified, when we are justified by free grace through Christ alone, when we are justified, he says a great exchange happens. He said it's like a marriage. And just, it just as in a marriage, when a husband and wife make vows to give one another their lives, he says, we have a great exchange with Christ. He said, all that we have goes to Christ. And what do we offer Christ? Well, sin, unrighteousness, faults, failures, right? That all that goes to Christ, and Christ gives us all that he has. And what does Christ have? Beauty, purity, holiness, connection with God, love of God, all of that is transferred to us. Luther called that the great exchange. He said the beauty of justification is that you get Christ. All that he has becomes ours. So friends, I want to encourage you to become more conscious of your union with Jesus, of what Jesus has given you and what Jesus gives you, and, what G- and that Jesus is present with you in the power of the Holy Spirit. You are his. So practically speaking, oh, I've got a, another good quote here for you. This comes from um, a contemporary theologian I really like named Michael Reeves, and he writes this about, uh, about um, union with Christ. He says, What a far cry this is from the exhausting idea that Christ has done his bit and now it's time for us to do ours. We are not chained to the task of trying to pay back the huge debt we owe him. We are united to the Son so we can enter into his life. Our joy, our prayers, our mission, our holiness, our suffering, our hope, all our participation in the life of the Son This means as you go through life, you can have the relief of knowing that you are not your own, facing a list of tasks. Whatever you do, you are not the indispensable one. You are simply entering into the life of the Son, sharing his agonies, his concerns, his passions and joys with him. Isn't that beautiful? Someday I want to write sentences like that. But he captures it. He captures it. You're not on your own trying to figure out how to best respond to what Jesus has done for you. You enter into the life of the Son. And you share with him his agonies, his concerns, his joys. They become ours. And he is one with us. So, I want to give you some uh, some application thoughts. When the trials, temptations, and afflictions of life come our way. And they're here, aren't they? Many of you are here today, and you're going through difficult, difficult circumstances with family, maybe with work situations, with relationships, with health. Some of you are here today, and you're confused and wondering, where is God right now? Because things seem to be falling apart. I want to encourage you. When the trials of life come our way, that you're not alone in trying to figure it out. Christ is with you. So when you are struggling, lean into your union with Christ. He is your sure foundation. When you don't know what to do, rely on your union with Christ. He will be your strength and your comfort. 
And when you've lost your way, when you feel like you have lost your way, or the circumstances have, have created such a, such a mess of life around you, you don't know where to go. Depend on your union with Christ. He is with you always. He will lead. He will guide. He's not abandoned you. He is near you. He will never leave or forsake you. Friends, it is not up to us to express the life of Jesus. The life of Jesus is present with us in the power of the Holy Spirit. Depend on it. Rely on it. Lean into it. It is ours. Our Savior, who died 2,000 years ago in a faraway land from here called Jerusalem, is now present in this building with this church and indwelling in each of our hearts who put our faith in him. So if you're here this morning and you are one who is struggling, lean into that union. Now for some of you, this may be news. This may be new news. Maybe you've never thought of the Christian life this way and maybe you're wondering if you even know Jesus in this way. And if you're here this morning, and this is a foreign concept, this union with Christ, being born again, and, and, and thinking of being a Christian in this way, I want to say to you that God has you here for a reason. That God has you here today to, to, to hear this for a reason. It just might be that the Savior is knocking at the door of your heart today and showing you who he really is and asking you, calling you to submit yourself to him. Maybe you've been living in that deep, dark dungeon of the ego, that deep, dark dungeon of yourself, and you don't see a way out. Let Jesus open the door. Let him be the light. Turn to Jesus today. He's the Savior. He's the Lord who's wants to invite you into his life, to share his life with you. Jesus isn't just a good moral teacher. Jesus isn't just someone that died 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem and is up in heaven way far away from us. No, no. Jesus, yes, up in heaven, reigning with God the Father, but present and wants to be present in your life by saying yes to him and the promises of the gospel and allowing the Holy Spirit to come and take up residence in your life. Friend, if this is you today, and you've not submitted yourself to Jesus, you've not opened yourself up to Jesus, today is the day that he's calling you, and he's calling you to himself. Don't deny him. Don't deny him. If you'd like to talk more about what it means to follow Jesus and to invite him into your life, I'd be happy to talk with you after the service. If you know someone here in the church that maybe you came with or that you, you know and trust, I'm sure they'd be happy to talk with you as well. But we don't want you to miss out on an opportunity to turn to Jesus and experience the real thing. Being a Christian is not just simply being religious. Being a Christian is living into the life of the Son.